Hey guys, how about another unboxing video? First up is something I really just chanced upon on eBay. I like wave tech test equipment, so I occasionally look through it. Uh, always nice to have a backup uh, sweep generator, for example. Well, this is a model I didn't know existed. So get out of here. <laughs> as soon as I picked up this box, I could hear all the foam in here. I thought it'd be foam peanuts, but these are rather hard foam cubes. That's that's a new one on me. I managed to get it out without splaying too many cubes on the floor. And what it is is a WaveTech 148A. You may have seen me use my WaveTech 183 before. Well, this is sort of the big brother, even though it has a lower model number, it's got more features. So like that, it is a function generator. Goes up to 20 megahertz, does your usual sine, triangle, and square wave, and you can vary the duty cycle. And it can do sweep, but what this one can also do is modulation, which my other one cannot. AM, FM, and PM. Not that I find PM too useful, but it's an interesting option to have. Now what's also nice is now that I've got two of these, you can do things like link them together with external trigger, or you can modulate one with the other. And you can also synchronize them. These are also nice because they have low output impedance, 50 ohms, so you can pretty much drive a speaker directly with these. You just got to be a little careful not to short them out, which leads me to the issue with this, it was cheap. I was the only bidder. The reason it's cheap, the overload light, light comes on. I don't have that on my other wave tech, and I'm not entirely sure what it does. Now, the seller did show it powers up, it produces a sine wave. But some of the controls don't work. So, I thought it'd be a fun little project because wave techs of this vintage, basically late 70s, early 80s, use all discrete off the shelf components. And uh, service info is available. I think I've already located this and downloaded it. So I figure a uh, pretty good chance whatever's broken can be fixed. Few cosmetic issues. There's a ding on that knob. A little chink out of that one, but not the end of the world. As long as the controls work. Curious that you can enable more than one. I wonder if you can do simultaneous, like AM modulation with a sweep. I wouldn't be surprised if you can. Those are kind of independent operations, so why not? One thing my 183 has that I think this does not is a phase lock to a crystal accuracy. Alright, so I think there'll be a complimentary piece of test equipment, nice to have. Speaking of test equipment, I also picked up one other item recently. The other item I picked up is yet another tube tester. And it is a Hickok. However, it's a model you probably haven't seen before. I certainly hadn't seen it before. And there's very little info about it online. It is a Model 230, which is the last new model they introduced, and uh, probably the cheapest one they ever made. So unlike the earlier ones, Hickok, I think 539, 600, 800, 6000, this is really meant for the low end, almost hobbyist market, I'd say. It's just emissions, no dynamic mutual transconductance, and uh, construction, a little on the cheap side. I was surprised to see it doesn't even have a line adjust. And the filament it just has letters, so <laughs> I should double check that really to see when I turn this on. I'm really getting 6.3 or 12.6 volts AC. Here's the schematic. Not a whole lot to it. Use your filament transformer with a whole bunch of taps for your different voltages, function switches. And parts, not a whole lot. A couple diodes, few resistors, a few capacitors. That's about it. 
However, the reason I wanted this is it does all the newer tubes. That's the one gap I've had in my tube tester assortment is I haven't had anything that can do the compactrons and the, I think they call them Novars or Novals. And things like little itty bitty new vistas. Uh, these guys. Uh, it was just my doorbell ringing with yet another delivery. Get to that in a moment. So as I was saying, um, I don't currently have any tube testers. Well, I shouldn't say that. I don't, currently don't have any fully functioning tube testers that can do these newer types. I do have a Suncor TC162, but it seems to have a shorted winding in the power transformer. So, uh, just kind of keeping keep my eye on it. Originally, I was hoping to get another TC162 cheap for parts, but the prices on those has got ridiculous, considering it's a basic emissions test. They're not a whole lot different than this. Why they cost several hundred dollars beyond me. Anyways, these go pretty cheap. This one's really clean. Supposedly fully functioning, so I figured, oh, what the heck, why not? So, uh, I already have done some basic chucks, so I'll just give you a quick rundown on how it works. There's a 15KY8, which that silver tone uses. So, the usual setup chart here 15KY8, so just set up these things. Well, most tubes, or I should say a lot of tubes, don't use these switches at all. It's like this one doesn't. So just J, C, J, C, and three goes into socket nine. This goes on two for emissions, but before you do that, oh, turn on, of course. Two lighting up. This is kind of odd that it tests for both opens and shorts. So the deal is you flip through the open positions, and it's supposed to have an open on two, three, six, seven. So two, three, ignore the other ones in between, six and seven. Great. Shorts go through the same deal and this time you don't want to see the light come on. The flashing is okay, it shouldn't stay on. And then you can check for uh, leakage. For grid leakage, you leave it in the position you check them for emissions. I'll look on the meter. So this tests for both grid leakage uh, on the top scale and heater cathode leakage as well. So for that, you go over here, and a little bit, but this is a brand new tube, so I'm really not concerned about that. So that's this scale here, HK leakage in microamps, so it's really, really low. And then you put it back where they say to, and you can check your emissions, and not surprisingly, they're, they're good. And this seems to be fully functioning. I don't think I need to go pop it opening attempt to service it or anything like that. So that is cool. Now as for that box that just showed up. Here's the box that just arrived from Texas. And it's a lot bigger than I was expecting. On the other hand the shipper did sell it would say it would be well packed. So I guess he was not kidding. So this is not actually a purchase. It is another restoration project that I've agreed to take on. I guess I'm inviting this stuff to happen by doing all these videos because somebody saw my Predicta restoration videos and wanted me to restore a Predicta or one of their Admirals. Funny thing about the Admiral, it's one of my favorite models, a little Bakelite tabletop, but when you examine it more closely, it had been gutted in a modern Solid state color TV put inside the cabinet, so scratch that. This is a Predict the Holiday, and his was a little rough. Missing the back, missing knobs, and uh, the controls cut out. 
and it's a chassis. So, missing the high voltage cover and uh, most disturbing to me is the control board here is gone that would have the combination power switch contrast control and volume. So, and here's, here's the wires that were cut off. But he went through their prop department, I guess, at a TV station, and he found that they had another predictor. That one had been gutted. The picture tube was gone. They put some kind of like light up display inside of it. It was just a prop. However, it does have all the knobs, although I think some of them were hot glued to the cabinet, but maybe you can pop them off. And it had the back. And I guess he dug up a channel knob. So I think. We're, we're, in other words, we're slowly getting together all the, all the bits and pieces that are missing. I can probably dig up a spare cover for the high voltage box. Oh, this got pulled out of the tuner. Um, so I think the main thing is going to be that control down here. Uh, very, I mean, not, not only is the power switch prone to failure, but... Uh, to find a combination three function control is just, eh, I don't know. But in the meantime, we can rig up a power switch, like on the back of the cabinet. And if I have to, I just use two individual controls. You could put contrast in the back. It's not something you adjust all that often. Uh, and then, you know, so have the volume control. Or I, could, I could probably dig up a combination power switch and one, a single pot so you get power and volume up front and hide the contrast somewhere so oh, we decided to proceed oh and he's got a uh, replacement 21 FDP for picture tube he has not tested it but uh, no he tested it for filament continuity and it was good so we'll keep our fingers crossed that it's got some life left but otherwise from the photos he sent me and what I can see here it's no, I hasn't seen a whole lot of uh, servicing. Uh, I, hmm. This board may have been pulled at some point, but it looks like it's all the original components still on the board. The reason I say that is some of these wires are just oddly attached. Like they were taken off and resoldered, or maybe somebody was just really sloppy at the factory. I don't know. Um, oh, um, yeah, we thought this was cute. Somebody wrapped looks like a length of solder around the fusible resistor. I guess to jumper it out. Although it looks like it's intact, so I'm not sure why you would attempt to do that. Hopefully it doesn't fry it or anything. And it's odd that the coax is pulled out of the tuner. Boy, does this have sticky wires. It's probably the worst predictor I've seen yet. And all the side controls are here. That's, that's a plus. Fly back. Eh, usual. Cheap ships missing. But. Keep hearing tales about how prone to failure these flybacks uh, were. Uh, this will be my eighth that I've examined, and so far every flyback's been just fine. They all appear to be the original, so I don't know if that's just a rumor that started way back in the day or what. But I, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> there seem to be a lot of a lot of mythology surrounding these sets that uh, I've just keep finding more and more not to be true. Circuit boards, easy to get out, easy to work on, other than one set that had bad sockets. All my other sets of sockets are fine. All the flybacks are fine. All the pitcher tubes, sure, some are weak, but none of them have had blown filaments. They could all produce an image, so I don't know. Whatever, maybe I'm just lucky. So hopefully the luck will continue with this chassis. Now, I've done enough video series on predictors. I'm not going to do an elaborate 20 part series on this, I'll bore you guys to death, and myself for that matter, when I have to edit the videos down. So I think I'll, uh, first off, I've got some outstanding projects i got to finish off, like the Admiral. Um, but when I get to this, I'll do a video or two on kind of the initial work, and then hopefully just jump right to the end for, for uh, the first power up test and skip all the in between work. I'm going to do exactly the same thing I do on all my other predict is pull the board replace all the caps out of spec resistors and all that good stuff and 
you know, do all the work under the chassis, probably recoat the flyback. You know the drill. There's something else I picked up recently I almost forgot to include in this video, which is a close cousin to the monoscope I showed in my last unboxing video. This is a bit newer and certainly more common. There's usually a few of these floating around on eBay on any given day. It's a Raytheon CK 1414. Uh, this, well, well, that's the date code. I guess it's from 1971. I'm pretty sure this is a rebuild that was never put into service. It's got a pretty clear ripple all around here. And it came in this box. So unlike the monoscope, which has a test pattern, uh, this has all the letters of the alphabet and digits and various symbols. In fact, the, uh, the internal sort of brand name for this tube is the Symbol Ray. Now what these were used for, something kind of crazy. They were not intended to be scanned across the whole area and produce uh, a test pattern. You were, it was typically you would scan a single letter or number at a time. What this was used for is a character ROM in early computer terminals and displays. Like I think airport uh, terminals that would show like the arrivals and departures would use this. So it's kind of like a master slave. You got like your main display showing the output and then behind the scenes for each like little section on the main display this would be flying around constantly picking out like A and then B and then C and then D and the output of this was routed with like an XY offset to the main display and it would letter by letter, number by number, row by row, build up the displays. This thing was just flying all over the place like crazy. <laughs> Here's the data sheet for it. Symbol ray character generating cathode ray tube and there is what's actually on the target. Got all various voltages and so on. This one runs in a bit higher voltage than the other one I showed up to. Uh, 2800 volts. It's got a button on the side for the high voltage. And uh, here's their operational diagram. So, for example, there's the airline schedule example I was talking about. So there's your actual display. And then here's this device where it's picking off the little symbols one by one. So it'd be very cool to find one of these complete display setups. I imagine they were rather bulky and complex. I'm curious to see what kind of crazy uh, circuitry they used to figure out all the offsets and how to drive this thing to keep up with the refresh rate on that using late 60s technology. Just in time to make this video, one last package has arrived. It should be my last purchase for a while. It is an original Motorola service manual for the VT-71 and VT-73 covers the TS4 series of chassis. Now you can download a free scan of this at the Early TV Foundation as you can many other TV uh, schematics and service info but it's nice to have a, a hard copy especially if you work on as many of these as I do because you get these really nice parts locators. Still not sure how they made these If it was modern, I'd say they took a photograph and then used some Photoshop effects to make it look kind of like it was hand-drawn, but I got a feeling these may really be hand-drawn. Otherwise, they used some funky processing, because they didn't have computer effects back then. Uh, but uh, regardless, they sure do look nice. 
So there were many revisions of this chassis. This uh, basically covers TS4B through uh, J late, I think, which is the last one. No, it just says 4J, so maybe they don't have the very last revision. There was a 4J early and a 4J late, just to keep things really confusing. Oh, no, <laughs> never mind. Here they all are. So, there's some service info in this, but uh, they also included the supplemental plot schematics. Which are nice to have, because they are large. And these all appear to be in good shape, like they may have never been pulled out or used. Because... You can imagine you pull one of these out, unfold to get it up on the workbench while you're working on TVs, it's going to get real grungy. But uh, this looks to be very clean. If I can just unfold it, here we go. So again, you can get scans of these, but of course the real thing is going to be more legible. Alright, so now and then these do pop up on eBay, so if you're interested. And obtaining one for yourself, just keep an eye on it. In fact, I think there's another one up there right now. So you get the schematics, you get the detailed uh, parts locator, both top and bottom of the chassis. Parts list. But I think what's the most interesting, at least for me, is all the theory of operation and service tips and alignment instructions. And uh, get uh, test waveforms and so on. So. Cool. All right. So that was going to be it for this video. Hope you enjoyed this look at some of my latest finds.